Virgil and Jan, um, Debbie reminded me that um, this was a birthday present. A year ago. And the person who helped me receive this present was Kristen Doolin. And so I preach this morning in honor of her as she's celebrating Jesus in heaven. Because Memorial Day goes beyond, doesn't it, just those who lost their lives. Um, I, we were praying earlier, and I just can't help but thinking that as we think of Memorial Day, we can't help but remembering those in our family here who have lost loved ones this year. So Kristen went to heaven just over a week ago. Russ's mom. Joan's son. There's others. So you can't, you, you can't, I just don't think you can go through a Memorial Day without thinking, it's not just those who died in service, and while we understand, it, it, it is to honor them, correct? But we've lost loved ones along the way, haven't we? Sons, daughters, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, grandparents, people we've cared about. Some of those deaths were tragic and difficult. Some of them were sudden, with almost with no preparation. So on today, on a day like this, um, our hearts are moved, and I just had to point that out, Virgil and Jan, and thank you, um, and we Kristen. and thank Kristen. <laughs> In what's it been now? Just over a week ago, maybe it's been a couple. I've probably lost the timing, but it, but Prince died. Kind of interesting that we use one little word like that to this, that, that as his name. But he was a great writer, singer, musician. From what we understand, has thousands or at least hundreds of additional songs that were locked up in his safe, that will now make his heirs even richer than the three hundred million dollars that he already has in his estate. Also, may make the IRS fairly rich too. I'm sure. <laughs> Did you know that over seven hundred people claim to be uh, related to singer songwriter Prince? <laughs> I don't know if the number's growing or not, but now the court has ordered DNA testing to find out who's related or not. Another interesting factor, did you know that in Minnesota where he died, that if you are a stepbrother, sister, stepchild, you get equal rights to the estate as somebody who's a blood brother, sister, son, daughter. So um, Prince's father had four children before he met and married Prince's mother. And so those four children, those step and you know technically w weren't born you know with with Prince, and but th because they're step, they have e get an equal share. So, by the way, if any of you happen to be related to Prince, you might want to get your get your name in there, and so you can get some of it. Especially if because there are going to be millions of dollars that are going to come to the estate. In fact, already there's been a lot of selling of his items. And please, no offense, man. I'm, I, I know people that love Prince are really grieving over that. But but it's interesting, isn't it? The number of people who are claiming to be 700 of them claiming to be his heirs and, and wanting a share of the money. It leads me into this week's uh, scripture in which a man comes running up to Jesus, falls down in front of him and says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? When I first heard that, I thought, inherit? Inherit. An inheritance is something you get because you're related to somebody who dies. Correct? And so you get some portion of their estate, some portion of their wealth, something that belongs to them, but you get it because you're related and they die. 
Now I do realize some of you will remind me of the story of the prodigal son who asked for his inheritance before dad died. But it was still about a portion of the wealthy estate that belonged to dad that he wanted to take and use and live, uh, use as his own. But it's still, it's, so it's about something that belongs to somebody else, somebody else that comes to you because you're somehow related. How do you get salvation because you're related? Well, we're going to see this morning that there are some scriptures that really remind us you don't get salvation because you inherit it from somebody else. But remember that thought. Because salvation does have an inheritance aspect to it. An inheritance comes to you because you're related to someone who dies and they pass on value to you because of their death. Just put that thought somewhere in your purse, your wallet, your front pocket and hold on to that as we go through this message this morning. What must I do? We're going to look at Mark 10 and we're going through verses 17 through 27. Verse 17 says, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? And isn't there this, this common kind of thought? And it kind of pervades many cultures. There's probably a certain process. There's certain things. If I do these certain things, then I'll get heaven. There's even certain religions that say, okay, you have to be climbing and doing things in different lives. And if you, if you do better, you come back as a higher level person. Or if you do worse, you can maybe you come back as an insect. So that's why you have to always watch out for grasshoppers. You never know. Could that be one of your previous relatives? And that, that there's this process of taking steps to get better and eventually to make it into heaven. There are people, well, you know, it, in fact, modern American culture is really sold on this one. Well, I think we all go to heaven, don't we? Modern American culture would say, yeah, I think I'm good enough. Now, they, they may have a hard time with somebody who's been a murderer or a rapist or somebody else like that. But most people would say, oh, yeah, I'm good enough. I get to go to heaven. Right, I say? Good enough. I mean, come on, you know, look around the room. Everyone here is, looks like you're pretty good. And aren't you probably good enough for Jesus to let you in? And I still remind you of the, 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 the troubling conversations I've had when coroners have met with family members after somebody's died and their statement is, hey, don't worry, they're in a better place. And I'm thinking, because they died, they, they, the coroner now knows that they're in a better place simply because they died? Uh, I, I don't think there's any promise that death just promises you you're in a better place. Is that the way you earn getting into a better place? And, and modern culture wants to say, it's, it's about what you do that's going to get you there. And surely God's just going to let us all in, which therefore means it really doesn't, you can be as bad as you want to be and you can still get in. That's not what the Word of God says. The rich man says, I want to inherit eternal life. I had to wonder as I was thinking about the scripture this week, does that mean he had inherited his wealth? In another text, it says that he was a rich young ruler. Oh, there, that even kind of gives us more insight into him. He probably got a lot of his wealth. Maybe all of his wealth had come to him simply because he had a rich dad or a rich grandparent or great-grandparent or, as Virgil likes to say, a rich uncle who passed on his wealth to him. Still waiting to meet him, Virgil. Will your family line get you into heaven? Simply because of the family you live in, is that going to be good enough to get you into heaven? Well, Jesus goes on. Verse 18. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. 
You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud and honor your father and mother. The Old Testament says that no one is good. In fact, if you turn to Romans, the third chapter, you will find a litany of several verses, several from the Psalms, one even from Isaiah, in which Paul is reciting the Old Testament teaching. And this man, this rich young man, who says, I keep all the commandments, should have known these instructions and these words. So, Quoting from Psalm 14, Psalm 53, Psalm 5, Psalm 140, Psalm 10, Psalm 36, and even Isaiah 59. Here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 3. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Well, this is bad stuff. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Not on Sunday morning. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Wow. And he wasn't talking about the United States, was he? Or he goes on. It's a couple verses later, Romans 3:22. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What's Paul just been saying? There's no one righteous. There's no one good enough to get in to heaven because of how good you are. All fall short. Jesus continues his conversation with the young man who's asked Jesus, you know, and called him good. And Jesus, even Jesus has said it. He says, look, no one's good but God the Father. No one is good but God himself. It's interesting Jesus is saying that because when, the, when this young man said it, he really had it right, didn't he? Isn't Jesus good? Isn't Jesus God? Jesus is God. Jesus is good. But the man doesn't understand that. So he's really trying to say, hey, good teacher. And all he's really trying to do is praise Jesus enough to say, hey, good teacher, I want you to see somebody else who's really good. And so Jesus is going to talk to him about the commandments and, and he's going to say, oh man, I've been keeping them since I was a baby. I've honored them all ever since I was a little whippersnapper. I've, I've never done anything wrong. He says, really? He says, well, maybe you have kept these specific commandments. But what have you done with them? With what have you done with all this goodness that you have had? Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go, sell everything that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. It's interesting that in Jesus talking about goodness, talks to this young man, he says, let me, let's talk about the second part of the Ten Commandments. 
You remember what the first part of the Ten Commandments are all about? All about God. No other gods before me, no idols, don't take the name of the Lord in vain, and remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's all about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. To love God completely. That's the most important part. And then when Jesus was describing the Ten Commandments to a man who, a, a legal lawyer who came to him and asked, you know, what, what's the most important commandment? He says, and the second commandment is just as important as the first. You need to love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the summary of the six commandments. And, and what were the first six commandments? excuse me, the second six commandments that focused on people. <clears throat> you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud and honor your father and mother. Five of them are all don'ts, right? Negative things you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to steal, covet, all these kinds of things, right? And then the sixth one is that one that some of us kind of forget. And it's the one that's supposed to go through all through life. Honor your father and your mother. Show them respect. And that's a challenge. Some of us, a greater challenge than for others. is how to honor that person, those parents that God has put in our life. And it's a command, folks. And this young man says, oh man, I've done it. I've done it well. I've, I've, I haven't done any of those negatives and I'm sure I've honored mother and father. That's why I got all the wealth from them. <coughs> well, you lack one thing. It's interesting. He uses the relational commands of the Ten Commandments in order to examine the man. He says, okay, these are all about your loving your neighbor as yourself. So how are you doing at it, young man? I'm, I'm great at it. Really? Okay, if you've really been so great at it, what have you done with your wealth? Have you been generous with your wealth? In fact, let's examine the first four commandments and really see how well you've done with those commandments. How well have you put God above all other idols? Let's make sure that you don't love anything more than you love God. Young man, I love you. So take all the wealth that you have, go give it to the poor. God's going to bless you in heaven and you come back and you follow me. And what does a young man do? He walks away sad. Because he has so much wealth. He says, I can't give it away. And what he's admitting is the wealth is his God. The wealth means more to him than the Messiah who's standing there in front of him. He says, nope, I can't, I can't give it up. I mean, I, I need this. I mean, if I give it all away, you know, people would like that. But, but come on, if I give it all away, I'll have nothing. And, and, and then you want me just to come follow you? If I give everything up and all I have is you, I can't do it. And see, what, what Jesus is helping this young man to see is he doesn't really love God with his whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. He loves him as long as he has his wealth. William Barclay, talking about this, says, without hesitation, the man said, he had kept all those commandments. Note one thing, with one exception, they were all negative commandments, and that one exception operated only in the family circle. In effect, the man was saying, I never in my life did anyone any harm. Oh man, I'm really good. And that may have been perfectly true. But the real question is, not have you done anyone any harm. The real question that Jesus wants to know is, what good have you done? Barclay goes on, and the question to this man was even more pointed. With all your possessions, with your wealth, with all that you could give away, what positive good have you done to others? How much have you gone out of your way to help and comfort and strengthen others you might have done, as you might have done? So the question for us is, are you generous with what you have? 
Are you personally generous with what God has given to you? God, Jesus is saying to this man, if you are so good, what have you done with what you have? And what he's pointing out to this young man is that his wealth is his idol. Matthew 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Sell everything, Jesus says. Could you all do that? Here's what I can promise you. The less you have, the easier it would be. If you don't have much, it's kind of easy to sell it. It'd be easy for Paul to get rid of his green car. I mean, it's pretty special to him, and, and it's, it's a mark of who he is, and we know him. When, I mean, you can see that car driving anywhere around Crestline, anywhere in the mountain, okay? Does it go down the mountain? No. <laughs> the less you have, the easier it is to just sell it all to become fully devoted and just follow Jesus. But the rich man shows, his response to Jesus shows how, how really he's been breaking the commandments. Does he really love the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his soul, with all of his strength? Do you? I have to wonder, what am I unwilling? What am I unwilling to give away to follow Jesus Christ? What would cause you to walk away from Jesus sad and broken hearted if he said, get rid of everything and come and follow me completely? What are you unwilling to give away for him. And may I remind you, what's that? My wife. My wife. <laughs> Thank God he's not asking you to do that. <laughs> he already gave her to you. <laughs> what are you unwilling to give away? Can the rich man make it to heaven with his wealth? There's a lot of people that try. There's the lady that had the, the, what was it, the Mercedes or whatever it was, and she said, I want to take it with me to heaven, and so she got, was buried in it. Of course, then there's the, there's the, uh, the, the, the man who gave money to a Catholic priest, to a Baptist pastor, and to a Jewish rabbi. And he told them, you know, I figured I'd give it to you guys and, and you guys can help get it to heaven for me. And the guy dies and, and, they, and these guys are all supposed to put the money in the casket. They all put their envelope in the casket and later the Baptist minister, they're asking him, so, so you, you, you put the money in there? He says, yeah, I wrote out a check and put it in there. <laughs> Some of you are getting it. <laughs> Can the rich make it to heaven? Not because they're rich. Not because they're rich. <clears throat> Verse 23 says, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. A camel cannot go through the eye of a needle, no matter how big you make the needle. 
Now some have said that there was actually an opening in the wall, in the gate, and it was a place where camels could, if they knelt down, they could then get through into the, the city and you would force camels to do this. But there are others that there's, there's no such thing. And if you think about it, how easy, once you get a camel down, can you, how, how do you put, get a camel to move forward? Okay, it makes a nice story. Okay, they, they did this and they, and, they, and they said that, you know, well, they did this and they had this lower opening. Well, the, the people are going through a big gate. Why don't they, I mean, why don't they just take everyone over there? Okay. But the fact is, is that a needle, do you all even know what a needle is? You use it to sew with, right? And a needle has a little hole in it where you put the thread through. And if it's, a, if it's large, you're trying to do leather or something like that, you, you might actually have a large needle. The one that I used for threading my baseball glove was very large and had a, had a hole about like that and leather could, leather could go through it. But it's still, can a camel get through even a hole like that? No, it's not. It's impossible. In fact, some theologians say that, the, that they were actually repeating a phrase similar to one that was a known phrase at that time. And, it, and the phrase was, you can't get an elephant through the eye of a needle. Why an elephant? Because the elephant was the biggest animal they could think of over there. And so you can't get an elephant through the eye of a needle. That's true. It's impossible to get an elephant through an eye of a needle. Now, maybe if you're a magician, you could, you know, make everybody, you know, think that you got, the, that it got it through. It's impossible. And that's what Jesus is saying. It's impossible to get your way into heaven by your wealth, by your goodness, by what you do. It's an impossible thing for you to do that. But it's not impossible for God. Heaven is open and accessible because of what God does, not because of what we do. Salvation's impossible for us, but not for God. There's some things you can't do for yourself. Tickle yourself. Go for it right now, everybody. It doesn't work, does it? Okay, if that one's too hard for you, lick your elbow. <laughs> Some things you are impossible for people to do. Winston Churchill said, there are three impossible things for me to do. He's a little more serious than the two I just mentioned. Churchill said, one, climb a wall leaning toward me. Although, have you seen some of those guys in some of those pictures? Who, oh man, wow, they're crazy. Two, kiss a girl leaning away from me. <laughs> and three, speak to a group on a subject about which they know more than I do. <laughs> An inheritance is something that is done for you. Right? It, it has nothing to do with who you are, what you've done. An inheritance comes to you because you were born to, adopted by, stepchild at, from someone else. It wasn't, wasn't you who did it at all. You can't make yourself into a relative to be an inheritor. Acts 16 says this though. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is Paul and they're talking to the jailer and he says, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. What did Jesus say, young man? Leave everything and follow me. And Matthew 19 says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will, oh listen to this, inherit eternal life. Now, if you heard my bias when I started this, this text and this message, I said, you can't inherit eternal life. You know, the rich man had it all wrong. 
And yet there is a dynamic that we can inherit, right? An inheritance is something that we get a value from somebody who has died, whom we are related to, who died for us. Jesus Christ. And when he died for us and we accept the payment of his death, we become children of God. We are adopted in. We are called sons. I know girls, you might not like this, but sonship is powerful. Okay? You too. We all become adopted in as sons of God. Equal heirs just like Jesus Christ. One with him. We're in the family. We get the inheritance. Do you get it? We get something special inherited because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Romans 8, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Daddy, all the Father. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Galatians says it this way. Christ has come to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Ephesians, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. And here's a preview for next Sunday. Then Peter spoke up. We've left everything to follow you, Jesus. Man, we've sacrificed it all. We've done what you asked that young man to do. We've been willing to go wherever you want us to go. And we've left everything. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will, we re will fail to receive a hundred times. As much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last in the first and the last first what does it say when you accept Jesus you become children of God John 1 12 yet to all who did receive him to those who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of God when you become a children of God you become what an heir of God Galatians 3 20 so in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith and first John 3 see what great love the father has for has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him dear friends now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known but we know that when Christ appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is children receive an inheritance Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. 1 Peter 3, 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with evil. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. And then the last book of the Bible, in one of the last chapters of the book, those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. What are you willing to give up to follow Jesus? Lord God, not just statements on a, in a book. We have more rights because of Jesus Christ to inherit heaven than most of that 700 will have any rights to princes' wealth. 
And our wealth is, wow, so much more incredible. God, help us to understand this privilege that you offer to us. And then, Lord, help us to be generous with what you've placed in our hands. And that includes our time, our thoughts, our talents, our treasures, everything. Oh God, help us to be willing to give up everything to follow you and help us to understand, Lord. I pray that we would understand that in giving up, we are gaining everything through Jesus Christ. The Lord, like you did for this rich young man, help us to see those places in our heart where we're unwilling to follow you. In Jesus' name.